There we go. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to A Thousand Shimmering Lights. I know we have a couple of viewers already online. Um, I want to remind everybody that this is the online YouTube planetarium show where you are the planetarium director. Uh, so whatever you are interested to learn about or discuss tonight, just throw that in the chat. And uh, I check that periodically throughout the show. I don't plan in advance anything that I'm going to say. Um, for the most part, I do have a couple things I want to talk about tonight. But uh, for the most part, I don't plan any of this stuff. And we just talk about whatever people are interested in talking about. Um, there's a lot to astronomy and a lot of great topics and questions people might have. Um, before we get going, as always, I'm going to mention that I am the membership director for the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society. Our website is nefas.org, nefas.org. So if you live in the greater Jacksonville area, uh, check us out. Um, we do a lot of telescope outreach and community outreach in the area. Um, and we are basically the astronomy club here in Jacksonville. Uh, if you live in the St. Augustine area, there is the Ancient City Astronomy Club, another great group of guys. Uh, many of us are members of both. I'm a member of both, for example. Um, if you are interested in becoming a member of our club, um, on our website we have this membership tab, and you can just click Join Nephus. I'll let that load for a second. Select New Membership and fill this out. Uh, club memberships are annual. Um, it's twenty dollars for a student or a senior, somebody over fifty-five. Uh, Forty dollars for an individual or fifty for a family. A uh, family is any two adults and however many kids they happen to be in charge of. And then um, we have a benefactor and a corporate sponsorship level. Um, corporate sponsors get to advertise on our monthly newsletter that gets sent to all of our club members. We currently have close to two hundred club members. I'm hoping to reach that 200 mark this year. Uh, benefactor members don't get anything extra. It's just a level for people who want to give more money to the club. Uh, I always tell everybody it's totally optional. Don't feel like you got to be a benefactor or like you're going to get anything special out of it. It's literally just some people feel like they really want to support what we do until they go for it. Otherwise, it's the same as the individual membership. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk for a second about our upcoming events as well. Uh, while I wait for more people to join the stream, uh, if you are watching the stream right now and you are able, go ahead and uh, leave me a quick comment in the comment section so that I know that you're here. Uh, that way, I think. Uh, also, just to let you know, somebody's, some people have pointed out to me that uh, YouTube makes you create a channel in order to comment in that comment section. Um, you don't have to actually post any videos or anything if you have a Google account and you just say, like, make a channel, boom, you've got a channel. It, there's not really anything that goes into it. Um, so, but, you know, if you don't want to do that, that's fine. If you ha do happen to know me, you can message me on Facebook or text me or any way to send me a question. Uh, and you can take part in the chat. Because uh, I do keep Facebook open as well throughout the show. Now, I do want to quickly talk about some of the upcoming events for our astronomy club. Uh, this Saturday and next Saturday are dark sky observing days, so we always go out to our dark sky site on the Saturdays closest to last quarter or new moon. The reason is because the moon itself is a source of light pollution, and so, well, I guess not pollution because it's a natural source, but it is a source of sky glow that makes it more difficult to observe faint deep sky objects, which is why we go to this dark location in the first place. Um, so last quarter of new moon is when we don't have a moon, and so we're able to see fainter objects. Um, this is the only NEFAS event that is truly weather dependent, because this is not an outreach event. This is the only event we do that is not an outreach, and what that means is our outreach events are outwardly focused. We set up telescopes for other people to look through. We educate other people, that kind of thing. These observing sessions at our dark sky location are inwardly focused. These are the things that we do for ourselves. And many of our club members at the dark sky site are making their own observations and working on their own goals. That said, they are still a very friendly atmosphere. Uh, you know, newcomers are always welcome. And you will often find that people say, hey, come check this out, come look through the eyepiece or whatever. But just be aware of that if you do want to attend one of our dark sky sessions. It's a little bit of a different atmosphere. 
Um, we also do observe strict light discipline, which means no white light. We only use dull red light, and that's to preserve our dark adaptation where your pupils open up. Uh, because when you're looking at some of these really difficult objects that many of us are trying to observe out there, your eye is the last thing the light passes through. So you want to be properly dark adapted. Uh, I recommend if you do plan on attending and you've never attended before, keep your eye on our Facebook page where I uh, always post a go, no go. And I arrange to meet people at a firehouse subs in McClenny and then lead them to our dark location because it is literally just the middle of the woods. So it can be difficult to find your first couple times. Um, but after that, oh, and the weather's not looking great this Saturday. Just going to be honest about that, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, next month, moving into June, um, June 4th is our Hannah Park Stargaze, and we also have a private Stargaze at um, Pine Ridge Community in Middleburg. Uh, I've always taken it upon myself to do the Pine Ridge Community Outreach. Um, the first time I went, I got to meet some of the people, really enjoyed it, and I feel like it's kind of like, it's kind of like my gig in a way. I, I really, I always try to do that one. Which means that although I always try to do all of our Hannah Park sessions, I have to choose one of the two. So I won't be at this coming Hannah Park, I'll be at Pine Ridge. But nonetheless, Hannah Park is, is still our big public stargaze. A lot of our club members are going to be there with telescopes. Uh, it is free to the public. You have to be in by 7.30. Um, the stargaze itself begins as soon as it's dark enough to start seeing things. Um, but the park closes the gate at 7.30. Hannah Park charges $5 a vehicle to get in, but we don't charge anything, and it is completely free, and all the telescopes are there for you guys. That is an outwardly focused event. Uh, then we have our board of directors meeting on the 6th. Anyone who's a member of the club can attend our board of directors meeting and see how the sausage is made. Uh, and then our general meeting on the 10th of June. Uh, again, uh, club members and guests, and whoever wants to attend a general meeting can do so. I don't know who our speaker is going to be for that one. Uh, oh, no, I do know who it is. I'm, I'm blanking on his name, but he's a physics professor. Uh, should have some really interesting uh, information for us. All right. Oh, and then uh, the 17th next month will be my next live stream. Okay, so with all that housekeeping out of the way, let me check the stream real fast and see if anything's going on in the comments section. Uh, yeah, we got Star saying hi. Now, Star, is that Star that I work with? Is that who I think it is? If so, what's up? Um, uh, mapping and streaming community says hi. Uh, Big Al B is online. Who will be doing the Sky Tour at Hannah? I don't know, actually. Uh, so I know that my Sky Tour is, um, you know, very well received. And it's kind of like one of the big highlights when we do Hannah Park. Um, unfortunately, like I said, I just cannot be in two places at once. Um, I might reach out and see who can do the Sky Tour uh, at Hannah Park, but at present we don't have anyone currently uh, set up for that. We don't have anyone uh, for that. And then Charlie Mike asks, um, Pine Ridge location. Uh, yeah, I can bring that up for you guys. Now, the Pine Ridge event is for a neighborhood that's asking us to come out and set up telescopes for their residents. I don't think they have any hard rules, but I think if a whole bunch of people show up because of my stream and they don't live there, they might kind of wonder what the heck. But if you're a NEFA's club member or somebody who has a telescope and you want to volunteer and lend a hand for the event, um, our website calendar does have all the information, and here is the address, 4200 Pine Ridge Parkway in Middleburg, Florida. And you're certainly welcome to come and, uh, and help out. All right. So, uh, got, definitely got a few people in the chat, uh, definitely, um, looking like we're going to have a great evening. So, um, before I begin, you might have noticed my channel logo has changed. Um, it is actually, I actually, I have it here. I, uh, painted this picture of Messier 83 and decided to, hold on. Decided to uh, make that my channel logo because I think it looks pretty cool. So new channel logo, which means if you are uh, if you go back and watch last month's 
on a live stream where I talk about the Veil Nebula being the channel logo. Now that's inaccurate, and that would be confusing for anyone who watches that video uh, now that the logo has changed. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what I always do and start off by talking a little bit about what's in the sky tonight. Um, what I've also done is between the last live stream and this one, I've kind of collected a few questions that have been asked to me in person out in the world or that I've noticed through Facebook or whatever that are kicking off points that I can use as well. Also, in case you guys were wondering, yes, I do want to talk about that black hole picture that the Event Horizon Telescope recently released because I am psyched about it. Absolutely psyched about it. Okay, so here is um, Stellarium Web. I always mention this, but I'm going to mention it again. Stellarium is free. There's a web-based version called Stellarium Web. And then if you just go to the Stellarium website, there's a downloadable version as well. The downloadable version is also free, and it's a little bit better, but it doesn't seem to want to sync up right when I do these um, broadcasts. But the web version seems to work a little better for these, so that's what I go with. Um, they don't sponsor the channel or anything, I just think they're cool. Um, so, it's, um, Solarium Web is also, when you first fire it up, it will fast forward to nighttime, right? So this is what we can expect to see in the sky tonight. Um, don't feel limited to tonight, though. If you do have a question about something in another season or whatever, one of the cool things about the software is I can time travel. But let's talk a little bit about what we can expect in the sky tonight. So it is May 19th. So we are definitely moving into summertime now. Um, I would say it's probably springtime, uh, moving into summertime. So all the wintertime constellations um, have pretty much left the sky. So no more Orion, no more Gemini, no more Auriga, no more Taurus. But we do have a whole new set of constellations associated with the springtime and summertime that we get to enjoy. Um, for one thing, we can find what's called the Summer Triangle. Uh, here we see it starting to rise in the east. Um, if, I, if I fast forward time just a little bit, I can bring that higher into the sky. The Summer Triangle is not a constellation. It is actually three bright stars, and each of these bright stars is in a different constellation. So we have the star Deneb, Vega, and Altair. And these correspond to the constellations Cygnus, in the case of Deneb, uh, Lyra, in the case of Vega, and Aquila the Eagle, in the case of Altair. If I add in the lines, you guys can see these three constellations, and if I add in the artwork, you can see what they're supposed to be. Um, Cygnus uh, is one of my favorite constellations because it kind of looks like what it is. Um, you've got this nice long neck all the way out to this star, Alberio. Last stream, I said, why is it called Gaia, whatever? This is the name of, a, like, a whole classification system. So there's a bunch of Gaia stars, or Gaia this, Gaia that, Gaia whatever. Uh, but this star's name is Alberio, and that's the beak of the swan at the end of the long neck. Deneb is the tail feathers. In fact, it comes from an Arabic root meaning tail. Um, and then we get this center point. And then we can come out to these stars for one wing and the other wing out here. Vega is the bright star in the constellation Lyra. Uh, once you find Vega, you can find this sort of triangle shape right here between Zeta, uh, Epsilon Lyrae, Zeta Lyrae, and Vega. And then you can find these two stars, uh, Zeta and Delta II Lyrae, and Sheliac and Sulafat, right? So... This, these two, and these two out here form a sort of parallelogram. Uh, if I switch off the artwork and everything, and click elsewhere, you can easily see this parallelogram once you've found Vega. With Altair, the trick is to find this chain of three stars, of which Altair is the middle. That is the head and beak of the Great Eagle. And if you come down to this star, Delta Aquilae, you can come out to one end and find one wing, the other wing, and the tail. This one's a little bit clearer if I add the lines, and if I put in the artwork, you can kind of see, although this artwork, they put the eagle's head over here. I've always interpreted these three stars as the eagle's head. I want to remind you guys as I go through, um, uh, as I go through the presentation, 
um, that you guys can jump into the comments at any point with any questions you might have. Um, and is my stream stuttering a little bit? Let me know if you guys are having some difficulty with the stream quality. Uh, yeah, it looks like it started to really buffer for a second. I apologize. Um, somebody said my face cam is laggy. Yeah, I noticed that too. It looks like everything's a little laggy right now. Um, let me check my uh, task manager real fast and just see... There's something killing my performance right now. Uh, I'm just going to kind of play through it. Hopefully the uh, the lagginess gets better uh, for you guys. Um, I apologize about that. Uh, I'm not sure if maybe my roommates are using up a lot of bandwidth. I don't know. But we'll just, we'll just keep trucking. We'll do our best. Um, yeah, so as I'm talking, though, feel free to throw any questions in the comments. I always say that there's no such thing as a dumb question, right? I genuinely believe that. There is such a thing as a dishonest question, like that's, you know, you know, hey, smart astronomy guy, you know, whatever, prove the earth is round or something, where you're not really asking your question in good faith, you're just trying to be difficult. But I think if you are genuinely asking a question from a place of curiosity, it's always a good question. There's no such thing as a dumb question, right? Because every question is just, I don't know something, and I want to know. And that's what we're here for. So don't feel weird or self-conscious about posting your dumb question in the chat, right? But that's the summer triangle. Um, it's a very noticeable asterism in the summertime. What an asterism is, an, a, is a, basically an arrangement of stars that um, is not itself a constellation. Now, speaking of the chat, um, somebody has asked, if aliens found the Voyager 1 disc, what do you think they would find most amazing or strange? It's really hard to say, right? Because the whole idea uh, with aliens is that they've evolved on a completely different planet under different conditions, and who's to say what's weird to them, right? Um, just about everything about us, I'm sure, would be weird. I will talk about some of my favorite things that are on the disc, though. Um, for one, they may find music odd. We put a lot of music on the disc, and music is something that humans appreciate because we have a sense of rhythm. And not every animal seems to have a sense of rhythm. There's, there's been almost no recorded instances of animals intentionally dancing to music. Like, there's mating dances that like birds do or whatever, but no real, like, yeah, I'm going to bop to this music. Although there's a cockatoo, apparently, that does. Um, you can find it on YouTube. But it's very likely that an appreciation for music might be uniquely human. And that aliens might be like, why did they put so much of the, all these weird noises on this disc? And they may not understand the purpose of it as music, right? Um, certainly, cultural artifacts of ours might seem strange to them. Um, our clothing, right, maybe seems strange. One thing that's on the Voyager discs, though, that I think is really, really interesting is around the time they were launching the Voyager space, uh, space probe, um, e uh, encephalograms, brain waves, were a really popular thing. And nobody really knew at the time if it is even potentially possible to take a brain wave and decode the thought that the person was having. Maybe, who knows, right? We didn't really understand how brain waves work. So one of the things that they did with the Voyager disc is they recorded uh, the brainwave pattern of a woman named Andrean, who was working on the Voyager product, uh, project, and put that on the disc. Maybe the aliens might have some way of decoding it, maybe not, right? Who knows? Um, and so they put that on there, but also just that's a neat thing to put on there. The story behind it, though, is really cool, because um, what she was supposed to do was sit and wear the thing and think about, like, philosophy and mathematics and stuff while it recorded her brainwaves. But the night before she was supposed to do it, Carl Sagan, who was also working on the project, uh, had called her up on the phone and said, hey, obviously there's something here. Because he and Andrean had, like, basically been having a lot of chemistry and a lot of feelings for each other. And they basically admitted to each other that they were in love, and they made an agreement 
that they because they were both married to somebody else uh, they agreed to leave their partners and uh, be with each other the night before she was supposed to record that those brain waves so she has said in interviews and things that when she sat down and they put the thing on her all she could think about was Carl right Carl, she had Carl on the brain um, in his show Cosmos when Carl talks about the Voyager probe and he says all the things that are on the disc sort of snuck in there in the list when he's saying all the various things. It's got music, it's got pictures of people, it's got greetings in various languages. He says, and the brainwaves of a young woman in love. But he doesn't say who or, or what it is in the show Cosmos. You have to research that independently and find out that he's actually talking about now his widow. She's, she's his widow now. Carl passed away. But I think that's one of the really interesting things that's on the Voyager plates, and if it's somehow possible to decode that, I think that that may be a very interesting thing for um, any aliens who find the plates. Of course, even when they made the Voyager plates, it was more of a symbolic gesture. Nobody expects anyone to pick them up. Space is utterly vast, and the odds of, even if an alien came here, that they would even notice this tiny machine and the vast emptiness of space it's not entirely clear that they would even notice the thing or even know how to use the plates. But um, nonetheless, they were like, if we're going to fire this thing and it's going to go into deep space, we should put a message in a bottle on it. So, like I said, more of a symbolic gesture, if anything. But still very cool. Alright. Um, also, I, I'm watching the little stream preview right now, and it looks like some of the uh, buffering and stuff might have cleared up a little bit, so hopefully the, the quality is here. So I'm going to get back to the um, the virtual sky tour here and talk a little bit more about what's in the sky tonight. Um, also in the sky, if you look over to the southeast, south-southeast, you will find two constellations very much associated with the summertime. Um, one constellation that's particularly easy to spot is Scorpius. So this star right here, Antares, is red, um, and in fact, I've often pointed this out to people in the summertime when I do presentations, and I've had people say, oh, is that Mars? So not only is Antares not Mars, its name means rival to Aries, right, rival to Mars, or as I like to put it, anti-Mars. So not only is it not Mars, its name means not Mars, right? Um, but it's called that because in ancient times they said this this rivals Mars. The star is red and bright like the way Mars appears to be. Uh, once you found Antares, there are two other stars here, Omniot and Tau Scorpii, that form a sort of you know chain, sort of slightly bent chain of stars here. And then it points at this other group, uh, Akrab, Deshuba, and Pi Scorpii, like this. So for me, that's the easiest way to find Scorpius is I look for the two arcs of three stars and three stars. Then going from this group of Antares, we can actually follow the chain down. Epsilon Scorpii, Mu Scorpii, uh, Eta Scorpii, Sargas, Kappa Scorpii, all the way up to Shaula, and then we come down to G Scorpii. It kind of curves around and then bends really sharply. And that is the tail and stinger of the scorpion, Whereas these two groups of three stars, I like to imagine as like the body of the scorpion. And then you kind of have to use your imagination to fill in the claws out in front. Um, so I really like Scorpius because it does kind of, for me, it's, it is kind of evocative of a scorpion. Now there's a story about Scorpius that says that Scorpius and Orion are never in the sky at the same time. And that's true. Uh, and the reason why, according to the story, is that um, there's a lot of different versions of this. So my version may be different from yours. But the version that I like is that Orion, the hunter, had bragged that he was the greatest of all hunters and that no beast on the earth was his equal. And so, to punish him for his hubris, uh, he was killed by a lowly scorpion. And so, because they were enemies in life, they were enemies in death, and so they are at opposite ends of the sky so that they will never be in the sky at the same time. So if you see Scorpius, you will not see Orion and vice versa. Uh, if I add in the lines, you can really see where that whippy tail is. You'll also notice this very clear teapot shape nearby. Now, this teapot is Sagittarius, and Sagittarius is important for one of the things I want to talk about tonight. 
Uh, someone said, yeah, it's, it's, it's good now. Cool. Um, maybe. I don't know. I'm starting to see some of that stuttering again. Oh, well. We're just going to have to deal with it. So Sagittarius um, is important for something I do want to talk about tonight, which is that black hole image, right? Um, that black hole is called Sagittarius A star because it is located in the part of the sky associated with the Sagittarius constellation. It's somewhere within this border, and it's actually right about here, right? Sagittarius A star is a supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way. Now, one thing I'll point out about the uh, Sagittarius constellation is that this teapot shape is made out of nothing but bright stars. So one thing this software does is the star's brightness is represented by the size of the dot. And so you see these are all fairly big dots. This is a fairly, fairly bright constellation, easy to find. Um, and the spout of the teapot points right at the core of the Milky Way galaxy, which again is where that Sagittarius A star is located. But there's a lot of other good stuff to look at in the Sagittarius area. First of all, you've probably seen these circle plus sign looking things. These are all globular clusters in this area. Uh, globular clusters are where you have thousands, sometimes even millions of stars all packed into a tight little ball. Uh, between Sagittarius and Scorpius, we have Messier 6 and Messier 7, also called Ptolemy's Cluster. But if I zoom in a little bit on this area above the, the spout, if you imagine steam rising up out of the teapot here, there's a lot of cool stuff where that steam would rise out if it's sort of bending backwards, if you can imagine that. Uh, for one thing, we have this right here, Messier 8. I'm going to bring up um, a visual of that. There's Messier 8, um, also called the Lagoon Nebula. Um, I use Wikimedia Commons so that no one can jump on me about copyright infringement. It's all Wikimedia Commons. Um, this is a star-forming region. All these stars that you see right here formed out of this gas. Um, a lot of nebulae, when viewed through an amateur telescope, are very faint, very small, very, very difficult to see, and are usually just slight glowy areas in the view. The Lagoon Nebula is actually fairly big and fairly bright, and you can actually see structure within it even through a modest amateur telescope, right? You'll see this bright area here, and then you'll see a second glowy bit kind of wrapping around here. The rest of this tenuous stuff you really won't see unless you image it, but this sort of like circle within a circle image with this gap between the two, that's why it's called the Lagoon Nebula. Um, is clearly distinguished in an amateur scope, so it's a really good amateur target. Um, if we get back to the constellation Sagittarius, if we move up just slightly, we hit another Messier object, Messier 20. Um, this one is called the Trifid Nebula. Now, this one is difficult to see. It basically just looks like some stars shining through fog, right? It almost looks like how it would look like when you see like a street light, but it's like really foggy. That's kind of how it looks to an amateur telescope. Um, if it's imaged, though, it reveals these really cool dust lanes. So that's the Trifid Nebula, right, uh, in that same area. Very cool looking. Um, but if we keep going, right, we hit Messier 21, which is a nice open cluster. A lot of open clusters in this part of the sky. Uh, if we keep moving over, uh, let's see, where is it? We hit Messier 23 over here. I'm going to zoom out a little bit to help me. Right here we hit something called M24. And this is actually called the Sagittarius Star Cloud. And what's interesting about the Sagittarius Star Cloud is it's not actually a thing. It is the lack of something. So when we look towards the center of the Milky Way, when we're looking in through the Milky Way, especially in this piece of sky, there's a lot of gas and dust between us and the distant stars. And that gas and dust um, attenuates that light. It dims the light of distant stars. And it's the reason why we can only see certain stars in the Milky Way by when we're looking through this direction. More distant stars don't make it through all that gas and dust. Well, the Sagittarius star cloud is actually just a gap in that dust material 
that allows us to actually see more stars. So if I bring up my visuals, uh, let me see here. Let me bring up my visuals. Let me just type uh, Messier 24. This picture actually shows the concept really well. Uh, so this image of the Sagittarius star cloud, you can see that um, where there's not the star clouds, you see these dark smears and everything, and that's all that gas and dust. So this image really makes it clear that all we're seeing is just an opening in the, in the gas and dust. The reality is there's just as many stars, uh, if I can bring my mouse up, there's just as many stars over here and over here as there are in this area right here. This just appears more dense because there's less in the way of us seeing those more distant stars. So Sagittarius star cloud is another really cool object, but we could go further. There's more to see over here. If I zoom out again, we can find the Swan Nebula, which is another beautiful nebula, another one that actually does reveal itself well in an amateur telescope. You'll also hear this called the Omega Nebula. Um, not really sure why. It doesn't look particularly like the letter Omega to me. But uh, let me just bring it up here real fast. So that's what this one looks like. Uh, it's a little rotated in this image, but we call it the Swan Nebula because this looks like the neck and head of a swan and then the body of it. you got to imagine like it's swimming across the surface of a lake. Through an amateur telescope, that swan shape is clear as day. It's really cool looking. Um, so that all that stuff is right over here by Sagittarius uh, in the sky. Um, also in this piece of sky we have Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus is interesting because um, if we, we were to adjust the zodiac, you know, the 12 signs, I'm a Libra, I'm a Cancer, whatever, to accurately reflect where the sun is at any given time of year, um, the sun actually does go through Ophiuchus. So a lot of people say that Ophiuchus should be the 13th star sign, right, if you are into that kind of thing. Um, that we really should consider Ophiuchus to be part of the zodiac, um, even though it's not traditionally considered part of the zodiac. Um, and there's a lot of really cool uh, globular clusters in there. Um, probably one of my favorite open clusters is here in Scutum. Scutum is the shield. And right here we have something called M11, Messier 11, and it's called the Wild Duck Cluster. It's a really cool star cluster. Um, I could spend all day talking about this piece of sky, but let's move on and talk about some other areas of the sky. Um, of course, we always have our circumpolar constellations. We've got Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. I'm going to double check the chat and see. Uh, still no questions in the chat. Cool, cool. Um, oof, that stream quality, though. Every time I go to check the chat, I see the video stuttering. And... Uh, Yikes. I, I apologize, man. Hopefully the audio isn't also stuttering. Um, let me know if it's if it's getting really bad. Um, but I'll just, otherwise, I'm, I'm just going to keep on trucking along. So, uh, let's see here. And again, if you guys have any questions, man, throw those in the chat. I do, don't feel like you're interrupting me or anything. Sometimes I'll pin it and come back to it. But I, I like to talk about what you guys are interested in. Um, but just to quickly tell you, our circumpolar constellations that we have, uh, the Big Dipper is, of course, part of a larger constellation called Ursa Major, the Big Bear. And then we can use the edge of the bowl stars to shoot right at Polaris, Polaris the North Star. So if we time travel, you'll see everything orbits around Polaris, right? Polaris is always north, and everything else appears to rotate around it. And I time traveled too far back. There we go. Now, if we take the Big Dipper and we imagine that we scooped up a bunch of milk or water or what have you, and then we poke a hole in the bottom of it, it will drip onto the back of Leo. Uh, even if I remove the lines, I personally always felt like Leo is not a difficult one to spot, and it's really cool looking, because a lot of constellations 
it's like, oh, it's three stars. That's totally a goatfish. And I'm like, yeah, I guess. Um, but Leo, to me, looks like what it is, right? Because if we zoom in here, we have Regulus, and then we hit Edo Leonis. And then, but if we go to Algieba, uh, Adafara, Rasalas, and then Epsilon Leonis, this curve is the main of the lion, right? Use your imagination to fill in his face, but we've got a lion's mane there. And then if we take Regulus and Edelionis and we draw the line back to Zosma and Cherton, that's the body of the lion. Like picture he's lying down like the MGM lion. And then Denebola is the tip of the lion's tail. So if I add in the artwork, now this artist chose to depict him running and added in some legs here. I've always pictured Leo lying, lying down, um, just because there's not really a strong indication of his legs with brighter stars. But it's up to interpretation, of course. Obviously, this artist knows what's up, and he put the put the main where it should go. Uh, you might have noticed that Denebola also has Deneb as the root word, right? So this is the tail of the lion, whereas Deneb was the tail of the swan, right? Deneb from the word meaning tail. You've also probably noticed by now that a lot of these stars have Arabic names. Um, basically, in the Middle Ages, there was a golden age of science and mathematics in the Arabic world. And so, although a lot of constellations, we get the information from the Greeks, we use the Greek names. A lot of individual stars have Arabic names uh, for that reason. They were, they were cataloging and naming stars. Okay, uh, once we find Leo, I'm going to point out one other quick thing, and then we'll take a break from talking about the constellations. Uh, in the sky to start talking about some other stuff. So, um, let me add the lines real fast and find it. Okay, cool. Here's a little trick. Oh, here's another trick for you from the Big Dipper, and it's going to lead into what I want to talk about. So, once you've found the Big Dipper, you see how there's this curve of the tail? Another word for a curve is an arc. You can arc to arc tourists, right? And then you can after you arc to Arcturus, you spike on to Spica. And Spica, once you've found Spica, it is bright. See how big that dot is? Um, oftentimes, when we're waiting for it to get dark enough to observe, um, and when we're doing like our public outreach and that kind of thing, and we start to notice individual stars coming out, Spica is one of the first ones that comes out. Um, once you've found Spica, you have found Virgo the Virgin. Um, this sort of blocky thing is her body. And she's got her legs coming off this way and her arms. She's kind of like, woo, girl, uh, laying down in the sky. One of the really cool things about this piece of sky is that between Vindemiatrix, which, first of all, great name for a star, Vindemiatrix, wonderful name. Between Vindemiatrix and Denebola is a region of the sky called the Virgo Cluster. Some of us in the Astronomy Club like to call this the Virgo Clutter because it is absolutely cluttered with galaxies. The number of galaxies in this piece of sky is outrageous. Now, when you look them up, some of them will actually be cataloged as being part of Coma Berenices, because the border between Virgo and Coma Berenices cuts right through that cluster. But make no mistake, they're all part of that cluster. If we zoom in in the software, right, all these little circles you're starting to see here in the software, every one of these is a galaxy. Galaxy, 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 galaxy. Entire galaxies of hundreds of millions, hundreds of billions of stars per galaxy. Some of these galaxies are absolutely outrageously huge. M86 could eat the Milky Way for lunch and not even notice. It'll ask for dessert. M87 could eat the Milky Way for lunch and ask for seconds. I mean, honestly, the Milky Way would be a snack to M87, like barely comparable. Some of these galaxies are monstrously huge. You probably notice this chain. We call this Markarian's chain, and Markarian's chain is um, a, a chance alignment of galaxies that's really cool. If you point your telescope, your telescope can see this much, depending on the eyepiece you have in it, but it's not uncommon to be able to get the entire chain in one view. Um, I make my sketches of objects, as you guys know, some of you guys know, and I sketched every little blurry thing I could find in Markarian's chain, and when I counted it later, I had sketched 11 galaxies. 
This is an absolutely outrageous number of galaxies in this piece of sky. Which is why this time of year is often called galaxy season. But it doesn't stop there. Leo is chock-a-block full of galaxies as well. Uh, we've got the famous triplet back here, right? We've got more galaxies up here. Boom, 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 boom. We've got a bunch of them in the tail section. Uh, if I can get it to show me some. There's one. Sometimes when you zoom in on the tail, Solarium kind of decides how zoomed in you need to be before it starts showing things to you. But there's a galaxy. There's, there's a bunch of them right there, right? So galaxy season for sure in this piece of sky. Um, and this will actually segue nicely into one of the big topics I wanted to talk about tonight which is the image of that black hole. So if we zoom in and we go to Markarian's chain and we find next to the chain M87, right? M87 is an absolutely huge galaxy. It is really, really big. In the heart of this galaxy is a super massive black hole. Um, so normal black holes, what we call stellar black holes, form when a star, a large star, collapses. And I think the limit is, I want to say it's eight solar masses. The star that's at least eight times the mass of the sun when it collapses will form a black hole. So it's really common for there to be black holes whose mass is eight or more times the mass of the sun. A supermassive black hole is a black hole that is absolutely mind-blowingly huge. So if your typical black hole is somewhere like 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 solar masses, the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way galaxy is 4 million solar masses. Just, they're just absolutely outrageously huge. And the one in Messier 87 is a thousand times more massive than that. So it's 4 trillion solar masses if I'm doing, if I'm moving the decimal point the right way. Something in the, in the order of, of that much bigger. It's, it's absolutely dumb to think about how many solar mass, how many suns worth of material is in this black hole. Uh, and I will show you a cool picture because there is something called the Event Horizon Telescope. And it got an image of that supermassive black hole. Um... Let's go through that black hole. See if we get the uh, the famous picture. Here we go, the famous picture. So, I'm going to show it to you guys now. This image was captured by the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and there's a lot to unpack in this image of what's going on. So, first of all, it's a radio telescope. So this is in radio light. But nonetheless, this is the first ever, and at the time, uh, up until very recently, only ever direct image ever taken of a black hole. Um, the way that they accomplished it is actually incredible. So um, basically a radio telescope can sweep back and forth across the sky looking for radio waves. If radio waves are coming from a distant object, if you're pointed at the object, the waves will line up and, and constructively interfere where they amplify the signal. But if you tilt the, the thing the wrong way and they come in at a weird angle, then when they bounce to the receiver, they don't line up and it destructively interferes. And so by sweeping and looking for the place where it does line up, you can find the thing, right? But every wavelength over, you get another sweet spot where it gives you a false image. So you basically get a bunch of stripes. But to figure out which stripe is the real stripe, you have to have a bunch of radio telescopes separated out so that all their stripe patterns overlaid will agree on one and that's actually where the object truly is. This is a technique called interferometry. It comes from the word interfere because that interference pattern. Um, the cool thing about interfer interfer interferometry is the further apart your telescopes are, the more resolution you have to see something really, really tiny in radio light. So, the Event Horizon Telescope is not actually a single telescope. It's a number of radio observatories spaced out all over the Earth. And they're always going to radio observatories and saying, hey, do you want to become a part of um, the Event Horizon Telescope, right? Um, 
and then they basically had them all sit in there gathering data, gathering data, gathering data, and then they made you got huge hard drives of data, sent them all to one place, and had machine learning AI sort it and figure out how to understand it. They fed it a bunch of example data of the kind of things it should be looking for, and the AI spit out this image, right? Uh, first ever direct image of a black hole. Now, black holes uh, warp space-time around them according to their gravity because Einstein's rel theory of general relativity tells us that the more mass you have in a given area and the more densely packed that mass, the more it will distort the actual fabric of the universe, literally distorts reality itself around massive objects, and that distortion is actually what causes things to be drawn to each other gravitationally. So the Earth holds us to its surface by warping space-time around it. Um, and we are held to the Earth by that distortion in space-time. Well, a black hole is so incredibly dense that the gravity ramps up right at that black hole area and the space-time is warped so severely that light can't escape that distortion, right? That's the black part of a black hole. A photon of light gets too close and it gets pulled in and it never can get back out of this, this hole in the universe, basically. Um, so, uh, the area around a black hole that limits how close light can get to it is called the event horizon. Um, but, light that, that doesn't meet the event horizon, like say a beam of light comes over here, will get bent and end up going into the event horizon behind it. So, you have the event horizon, but there's an area around that where you still have light that doesn't make it all the way around and back to us. So that's called the shadow of the black hole, and that's actually the dark area you're seeing in the middle of this image. Um, now, if the black hole isn't currently pulling any, any material in, you don't really see it, right? It's just a nothingness in space. Um, you can infer the presence of a black hole based on how it interacts gravitationally with the things around it. And that's how we found the one in our Milky Way, actually, the first time one was discovered, is because they saw stars orbiting a, a, a place of mass and doing the calculations revealed that there was something incredibly massive there that we couldn't see. Well, if material is being pulled into a black hole, then that material will begin to orbit around the black hole and swirl around it in a flat disk that we call the accretion disk. Accretion means to pull something in through gravity. And that material is being accelerated by the gravitational pull of the black hole to the point where friction in the material makes it heat up and glow. And so that's what we're seeing as the glowing ring around this central part of this black hole, is this material falling in. But what's interesting about a black hole is, because it's warping space around it, and bending beams of light so severely, um, black holes don't behave like you would expect intuitively. So if I have this Gatorade bottle right here, oh, hold on, I'm going to hide the logo. Ah, if I have this bottle of unnamed spa uh, you know, sports drink of some kind, and then I have this die, right, this six-sided die that I have, if this is behind the, the bottle, you can't see it. The bottle's in the way, right? Well, a black hole doesn't work like that. The black hole is distorting space-time. Hi, the logo. And any light behind it gets bent around to the front. So what you would have is, if this were a black hole, this dive wouldn't be hidden. You would see it smeared all around the object. The light from things behind the black hole gets brought to the front. And that's actually what we're seeing in this image as well. So... Imagine there's a flat disk like this going around, but as the disk passes behind the black hole, it gets warped above and below it. It gets pulled out around it. So any angle you observe a black hole, it looks like a ring, no matter what angle you see it. Um, this was uh, famously in the movie Interstellar. The black hole in Interstellar looked like that, right? So let's see if we can get it up here. Interstellar black hole. No, I'm really going to get hit with a, with a copyright strike. Um, you know you know what, and I don't think they have one on the Wikimedia Commons anyway. Um, but that's how that would look in, in Interstellar, right? Now, why is it brighter on one side than the other? Well, that is because um, this material is being accelerated at close to the speed of light, but not quite the speed of light. And so um, 
where the material is being flung around towards us, it's thro basically like throwing that light ahead of it. It's shining brighter there than where it's being pulled around away from us, and so is the light. This is called Doppler beaming. And so it makes one side of the black hole appear brighter than the other. Um, and so this is actually indicating for us the direction this material is going, right? Okay. So this image comes out, and this is the supermassive black hole at the heart of um, the star, or the, the galaxy Messier 87. Uh, you're not doing it right if I don't have more copyright strikes than there are frames in my video. Yeah, highly agree, right? Um, no, highly disagree, actually. I did get a strike, not through YouTube, but Facebook, which is why I do Wikimedia now. And it literally just said, there's copyrighted material. And I'm like, oh, cool. I get to watch the entire two-hour video I did and see where the copyrighted material is that you won't tell me what it is. Um, so instead, I just pulled it down, and I just do Wikimedia now. All right. So the reason why I explained so much about this black hole is late April, the announcement was made we are going to make the Event Horizon Telescope comes out and they say, we've got a big announcement. It's about the Milky Way, May 12th. Stay tuned, right? You could not believe how excited I was about this because I knew that the next target for the Event Horizon Telescope was Sagittarius A star, that supermassive black hole that is um, not on my screen anymore, I, I realize. Um, it, I, I thought I was still looking at Sagittarius for some reason, but that supermassive black hole in the heart of our own galaxy. That would be really cool, right? So, um, they announced it, and I gotta tell you, it looks awesome. This, this, ladies and gentlemen, is... Four million times the mass of the sun compressed into a tiny little dot right here, eating everything in its vicinity. This is the image of Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole that lives at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And what's funny is, like, when I, uh, I'm training some new hires at work right now, and I told them all about it, I'm like, yeah, I'm super psyched, man. And uh, one of them said, hey, Dave, um, they made the announcement, you should check. And... I looked at Wikipedia, and Wikipedia had already updated the image in the article about the supermassive black hole to be this image. Somebody had already edited the, the Wikipedia article. So what we're seeing here is all that stuff I described already. Now, the thing that had me curious about it is why do we have three bright glowing patches? Well, the thing to keep in mind is that this is a still image of something that's actually active and working, right? So one question is why is it so blurry this is uh, basically it's like motion blur right another question is why is there three three lobes on the image and uh i can't even take credit by the way i gotta check the um i gotta check the uh uh the name of the video and who who made it but there was a youtuber um, that made a video about this, and some of this information I got from watching her video, I'll have to find it. But um, basically what she was explaining is that um, the the material is kind of orbiting, so this, this was changing and shifting over time, and we got a snapshot of it, right? Because there's clumps in this swirling cloud of gas that are glowing more brightly, and so we're seeing that clump in a couple different positions. Also, remember that the black hole itself is warping all this light around it, um, but we are nonetheless getting bright areas where that Doppler beaming has happened, where the light is being thrown at us rather than the other direction. Um, and then the, the event horizon in the black hole itself uh, residing here in the middle. So really, really cool. Um, you might wonder, why did we look at the one in Messier 87 uh, before looking at the one in our own galaxy? Well, it happens to be that although it's about a thousand times further away, it's also about a thousand times bigger. So it was kind of like six in one hand, one, one you know, half dozen in the other. But also, Messier 87's uh, black hole is actively feeding, and we know that because it's shooting out the, the two streams of x-rays that black holes do when they feed. Um, it isn't as blocked by gas and dust as the one in our own galaxy, 
So it actually presented fewer challenges uh, to Image, but the team that Image did, their goal, their very next goal was always to do Sagittarius A-Star, and now they finally released it. So that was um, last... What was that? Yeah, that was last Thursday. That was a week ago. And I was like, oh, I'm talking about this on my live stream for sure. Um, but don't, again, don't let the fact that I have a couple things I wanted to talk about make you feel like you guys can't ask your own questions. Um, because I'm also kind of killing time until you guys ask stuff. If you don't ask anything in the group chat, I just have to make up stuff to talk about. Um, but my preference for this show is to talk about the things you're interested in. And even if you don't necessarily have a question, you can even just post a topic. Some topic about astronomy that you're interested in discussing. I'm also going to take a quick look at Facebook and see... Um, oh, I see who Charlie Mike is. Okay, what's up, man? Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to out who it is because I'm, I'm guessing maybe he chose Charlie Mike to hide his identity. But um, Charlie Mike, I will just say, is somebody very important to me who's watching the stream. Um, but yeah, if you don't have any... Um, uh, questions. Oh, actually, somebody did message me on Facebook. This was... Oh, uh, that was sent to me this morning. I will check it out later. Um, oh, you know what it was? Okay, one of my coworkers had mentioned um, a TikTok video about black holes that I had meant to watch before doing this stream, and I forgot that she was going to send that to me. Oh, well, clearly we ended up talking about black holes anyway. Um, I will still watch it afterwards and see what I think. Um, but, um, yeah, so uh, definitely get your questions or topics in the chat, anything you guys want to talk about. I want to talk about the things that you guys are interested in. Uh, what do you think astronomy would be like on Mars? There we go, someone's asking questions. That's a really good question. What would astronomy be like on Mars? Um, for one, it wouldn't be super different from astronomy on Earth, right? So on Earth, we point telescopes at the sky, and we look at things out in space, and we study them. Um, of course, if you're on Mars, you can't observe Mars through a telescope. Um, Mars does have a couple advantages, actually, that the Earth doesn't have when it comes to astronomy. One, Mars' atmosphere is much thinner. So on Earth, the atmosphere is always... Um, getting in our way for astronomy. But on Mars, I'm going to bring down this image of the black hole since we've changed topics. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring up an image of Mars. Why don't I do that? So I'm just going to bring up an, an image from the Curiosity rover um, of the Martian landscape. No, I'm not. That, that image is going to take forever to load. My goodness. Give me a second. Uh, we're just going to take this cool Hubble image of Mars. Just so I have a picture while we talk about Mars. Alright, so Mars's atmosphere is much thinner than the Earth's. So on the Earth, the atmosphere is always a concern when we do astronomy. Um, we can't see through clouds, right? Um, but even without clouds, um, you know, turbulence in the air causes problems. Um, astronomers actually measure the sky quality on two metrics. Um, there's seeing, which is how steady is the sky, and there's transparency, how transparent is the sky. That's a measure of like light pollution, um, how, many, how much cloud cover there is, or if there's any haze up there, as well as things like dust and stuff up in the atmosphere. Now Mars does occasionally have dust problems, but assuming that there's not some kind of dust storm going on on Mars, the atmosphere being thin means that it will be more transparent, and it will have better seeing. It will be more stable, and even if it's not stable, it's thin enough that it's not making as big an impact on the image that you're seeing. So you do have that advantage on Mars. Another advantage that an astronomer on Mars would have is the fact that Mars's moons are very small and won't contribute a lot of light. So on the Earth, you remember earlier in the uh, broadcast, I mentioned that in my astronomy club, we go out on last quarter and new moon night when we want to do our own observing. 
and that is because the moon contributes a lot of light that makes it more difficult to see the things we want to see. Well, um, on Mars, that's not really a problem because Mars's moons aren't really bright. Uh, I'll show you Mars's moons. Uh, they're basically like little potatoes. Phobos and Dimos. Right? These are Mars's moons. They're not even big enough to become spherical under their own gravity. Um, when seen from the, from the Martian surface, they just look like a couple more stars in the sky uh, that are, you know, just little dots. But if you watch them after night, after night, you go, oh, yeah, they are kind of moving, right? To give you a size comparison, this is Buenos Aires next to Phobos and Deimos, right? So not very big moons uh, by any stretch. Uh, so Mars, like I said, has that advantage going forward as well in terms of um, astronomy. Uh, Earth would appear in the sky as a planet from time to time. Like Venus, it would follow the sun as it sets um, because it would be closer to the sun than Mars. It would mean that if you were to observe Earth from Mars, Earth would go through phases, like the way Venus goes through phases, where sometimes you see like a crescent Venus or like a gibbous Venus. Right? The Earth would do a similar kind of thing. You would sometimes see a sliver of Earth, sometimes see the whole Earth through, an, through a telescope if you were looking at, at Earth from Mars. Um, Jupiter and Saturn would be a little closer, although not appreciably so. The distance from Earth to Jupiter is immense, and Mars is only a little closer to Jupiter than we are. Right? Um, so, uh, for anything deep sky or outer solar system, you probably wouldn't really notice much of a difference other than just having great observing conditions. So, really good question. Um, 8K ultra upscaling image of Mars is like, I know, man. I, I tried to click that image and realized it was probably going to destroy the stream uh, just, to, just to download that thing. Um, how many moons will Earth have in 200 years because of asteroid mining? That's another great thought experiment, I guess. I don't really know that I have an answer to that, but um, if we do go capture asteroids, bring them back, and put them in orbit around the Earth so that we can mine them, yeah, we would end up getting extra moons in that sense. Um, presently, the Earth has only one moon. Every so often, you'll hear something about the Earth having a second moon, and they'll say, like, oh, the Earth's got another moon, blah, 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 and then, like, when you look into it, it's not, right? So, like, there's an object called Cruinia that every so often people say, oh, it's Earth's second moon. And it's spelled weird, by the way, but it's pronounced Cruinia. But it's spelled like Cruithni or whatever. Um, it orbits the sun. It does not orbit the Earth. It shares the, its orbit overlaps severely with the Earth's orbit so that as the Earth orbits and this thing orbits, it's usually ahead of us. It will slowly drift away and come around the other side and then slowly drift back. And it is interacting gravitationally with the Earth. We kind of kick it back and forth like a soccer ball. But it is highly inaccurate to say that it's Earth's second moon. So it is interesting that you bring up the idea of additional moons. Because up until the present day, um, it, yeah, it's being moon because of its orbit shape. Right. So from Earth's perspective, it looks like it traces out a kidney bean shape in the sky as its orbit and our orbit are severely overlapped. But it is not actually a second moon. Um, now, uh, let me talk about something that um, I mentioned at the beginning of the stream. I've gotten a couple of questions from people like in my day-to-day -day life or that I've seen online that are cool jumping off points. So I'm going to bring up um, a couple of those. One of them, somebody asked, and I am often asked this question, you know what, if I'm going to have Stellarium up for background, I'm going to zoom out. I'm often asked by people various versions of what is that really bright star near the horizon throwing disco-like colors at me, right? What is that? And the answer is... It depends. <laughs> because um, if I pull up my planetarium software, you'll notice that the stars, um, they move, right? If I go through time, boop, 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 right, if I go backwards through time, right, 
So which star is near the horizon is going to change? Like, like here it's Sirius, but if we wait, now we've got, you know, Alphard near the horizon and so on. So if somebody says, what's the really bright star near the horizon that throwing out disco colors, it could be any number of stars. Some stars that I've seen do it are Sirius, um, Canopus, uh, uh, Rosselhog, I think. Um, uh, Capella, I think I've seen Capella do it. Um, Spica, right? So let me explain what's actually happening. When you see a star down near the horizon, um, for, uh, so first of all, I saw this question posted on Facebook. It was in the Kerbal Space Program Facebook page. And I'm not trying to throw any shade or throw anybody under the bus, but one of the comments somebody had was that it was the star Sirius, which was correct. At that time, it was Sirius. Right? Let me see if I can bring Sirius into the sky here. Do, 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 do. Oh, you know what? That's the wrong direction for Sirius. And also, let me change to the winter time. The winter time is better for observing Sirius. Okay, give me a second. Here we go. So here's Sirius, right? And we're going to change the time. We're going to bring it down near the horizon, right? So it was like this. And it was throwing a bunch of colors, right? So somebody said, what is this really bright star flashing near the horizon? And somebody said, well, it's Sirius. And I said, Sirius is a binary star. So Sirius has a smaller star orbiting around it. And that's why it looks like it's flashing. Because every time that other star orbits around, it... Um, blocks the light or whatever. It is true that Sirius is a double star, but the companion star would be, have to be orbiting at an absolutely mind-blowing rate for its effect to be literally like, like this, like flickering. Um, not only that, but, but we wouldn't tell from naked eye that small dip in light from the companion blocking the star. What's actually causing the effect is the same thing that makes all the stars twinkle. And that is um, turbulence in the atmosphere, right? So warm and cool air mixing in the upper atmosphere causes all these little swirls and eddies and things. And different temperature air has different refractive indices. So light is bent different amounts in different temperature air. Well, when an object is up near the top of the sky, it's like comes straight down through the Earth's thin atmosphere and right to your eye. So it only passes through a small amount of air. But when it's down near the horizon, it's coming over the Earth's surface, passing through all that air on the way to you. So the closer to the horizon something is, the more amplified the flicker effect of these different pockets of, of different temperature air that causes the stars to twinkle, right? That thing that we call seeing in astronomy. It's also the case that different colors of light are different wavelengths of light, Blue light is more energetic than red light. It's a shorter wavelength. And so blue light and red light and green and all the other colors in between are bent different amounts when they pass through the same pocket of air. Right? It's the same effect as when you take a prism and you shine light through a prism and you get the rainbow, or you have the moisture in the air doing the same thing, creating a natural rainbow. So what's happening is the light from this distant star all this shimmering air is doing this and it's throwing the colors all different ways before it reaches your eyes so the blue reaches at a slightly different angle than the red whatever um and so you you see the star appears to flash different colors usually red white blue and and that kind of thing so that's actually what's happening so if you've ever seen that phenomenon near the horizon now you know um what's going on um so the other question that somebody had asked between my last live stream and now, um, one of my coworkers watched the last live stream, and she got as far as, um, and Whitney, if you're watching this, what's up? Um, she got as far as watching me talk about how the sun is a star, um, and she said, that's really interesting. She goes, I guess I always knew that the sun was a star, but she said, um, but does that mean that the other stars are as big as the sun, Right? It's a really interesting question because it shows me that she has an understanding of the size of the sun, for one thing, right? The sun is enormous. 
Um, and if the other stars are suns, right, she connected those dots. So maybe they're really big, like the sun is really big. What I have the, the joy of, of telling her that I have the joy now of telling you guys is that not only are the other stars as big as the sun, but most of them are much bigger. The sun is actually not a terribly large star. Uh, during last month's stream, we talked about spectral types, O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. Um, but stars come in different sizes. Bigger stars burn their fuel more hotly, and they glow blue, and smaller stars glow more red because they're cooler. Um, and so you have some of these blue stars that are just really, really huge. Um, Al says he has to, uh, has to run. Al, we will talk soon, man. Uh, again, uh, awesome that you came out to the Lunar Eclipse. Really enjoyed having you there. And thank you so much for watching the stream. Um, Al is a member of our astronomy club and a really cool guy. Uh, and he comes to a lot of our events. If you go to Hannah, I guarantee you, you'll see Al there. So, um, the stars, they do come in different sizes, right? Um, and the differences can be, well, I would say astronomical, but that feels like a bad pun. But let me do star size comparison, and let's take a little trip down below your mind lane real fast, right? Um, if, if you you know, get into astronomy and you don't periodically have your mind blown out the back of your skull, you're doing it wrong. Um, so this is a comparative size of several objects. So if we start off in the number one corner here, we have Mercury, Mars, Venus, and the Earth, right? Now, in the next picture, this is the Earth down here next to uh, Uran Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. So you see how, how much bigger Jupiter is than the Earth, right? Now, here's Jupiter. Here's a red dwarf star called Wolf 359. If you like Star Trek, that's where they fought the Borg. Uh, and then this is the Sun. So look how, this is how big Jupiter is compared to the Earth. This is how big the Sun is compared to Jupiter. And next to it is Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Look how much bigger it is than the sun. And then we get to this next picture, and Sirius is now this little marble next to Pollux Arcturus. Remember Arc to Arcturus? The sun is invisible at this scale. Look how much bigger Arcturus is than Sirius, which is this much bigger than the sun. Aldebaran, this is uh, in Taurus. Then if we move down here, this little guy down here is Aldebaran now. Right? And now we have Rigel next to it. Then Antares, Betelgeuse, the shoulder of Orion, right? Is this much bigger than our, than Aldebaran, which is that much bigger than Sirius, which is that much bigger than the Sun. So, yeah. These stars get so big that the Sun is a speck of sand compared to them. And then we get all the way up to V.Y. Canis Majoris. And I recently read um, that there was a new star that is, is now the largest star we've ever found. Um, and I just can't remember its name. Um, give me a second, because somebody posted about it on Facebook. So, if I pull up Facebook, uh, actually, I'm looking at something else. Ah, never mind. Okay. So, yeah, that is, that is how big stars get. They get absolutely huge. One thing you might have noticed in this progression is the color change. Right, we had reddish stars and we went to blue, and then suddenly we went back to reddish colors. What happened? Well, it is true that the big stars, the, the blue guys, are often really big. Sirius is really big. These guys are reddish, and then we have another really big blue guy here, and then more reddish ones. And that's because in addition to main sequence stars, that are stars that are still burning their hydrogen fuel and doing the main part of the star's life, blue stars are bigger than the others. But when they die... They all swell up many times bigger, and as they expand, they cool and turn red. So bigger than the biggest blue stars are these really big red ones that we call red giants, right? Um, and so that's why a lot of these absolutely heinously big stars are all red, because these are actually all dying stars, right? Um, Sirius and Rigel are not. But Pollux, Arcturus, actually uh, Pollux, yeah, I think so. 
um, Betelgeuse, Antares, these are all red giant stars. These are stars that have neared the end of their life, have run out of hydrogen fuel, and they've swelled up and turned red as they cool as part of, um, part of uh, the process of dying. And they become super giants, as uh, Martian points out in the, uh, in the chat there. By the way, Martian, glad to have you tonight, man. You've really been um, very active in the chat, and I appreciate that. Guys, don't let Martian carry the whole show, man. You guys ask whatever you're interested in. I'm going to take a break for, from talking about star size to give you guys a chance to ask your questions or present your topics. Um, we're at the 8.45 p.m. part of the stream, and <laughs> Martian says, too bad, right? Um... We're at the 8.45 p.m. Uh, time frame here. Um, this thing goes till 9.30. So we've got another 45 minutes worth of the stream left, and I would really love to talk about the things that you guys want to talk about. So I'm going to put myself on pause a little bit and let you guys, let you guys do that. Um, but I'm not just going to sit here silently. What I'm going to do, actually what I'll do, I'll let the chat catch up to me and let you guys post any questions or topics you're interested in, but I will remind you guys now at the 845 part of the stream, um, since some people have joined and some people might have dropped off, some people might watch this later, so let me remind you guys and do a little house cleaning again. I am the membership director for the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society. Don't believe me? Check our BOD. There I am, baby. Membership director. So, we are the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society, or NEFAS. Our logo should appear here any moment now. Um, our website is NEF, there it is, NEFAS.org. NEFAS.org is our website. We are, by the way, I didn't mention this earlier, we are a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization. So we are a nonprofit organization. Donating to us is donating to a charity. Um, I don't monetize these videos at all because I promote a nonprofit on here. I don't know if that's a conflict of interest to monetize the channel while promoting a nonprofit, but I just choose not to anyway. Not that I think I'd make much. I've got like 70 subscribers. But that is us. We are the Jacksonville Astronomy Club. So if you live in the Jacksonville area and you are interested in astronomy, definitely check us out. Uh, if you're interested in joining, you can go to Membership Join Nephis. Uh, memberships are annual renewal, and you just hit New Membership. When you go to Renew Your Membership, you hit Renew Membership. Fill all this out, and then our rates are $20 for students and seniors, $40 for an individual, or $50 for a family. Again, these are annual dues. So if you are in college for literally $20 a year, you could be a member of the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society. Um, family is what we describe as any two adults and whatever kids they happen to be in charge of. We don't get specific about families. We love all families. Um, benefactors are just people who want to give us more money. There's literally no difference in terms of what you get out of being in the club between being a benefactor and being an individual member. You, this is just for people who want to. They just feel like they want to give more to the club. You can be a benefactor. Corporate sponsorships are for uh, corporate sponsorship, obviously. You get to advertise in our newsletter, that kind of thing. Um, what do you get for being a club member? Well, you do get the newsletter every month. Um, you are part of the Astronomical League as well, if you're an EFIS member. Um, so you can start working on Astronomical League observing programs and get certificates and pins for meeting certain goals. You get their newsletter as well. Um, I believe we're part of the Dark Sky Association as well. Um, we also have a number of 6-inch aperture Dobsonian telescopes that our club members can check out for a month and bring back like a library book. Free of charge. Well, free of charge. It's part of your membership, right? So you can literally say, I want to borrow a telescope. Here you go. Enjoy that telescope for a month. Bring it back. Right? One of the perks of membership. Also, we do occasionally do things that are for our members only. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback, and I'm a little hesitant to even mention it because I don't have anything official put together yet, but I've gotten a lot of feedback from people who say, I joined the club, 
and I'm very new to astronomy, and I would love to have some kind of a setting of, like, almost like a classroom thing. Like, we're going to all get together, and we're going to learn how to do this. And since I'm the unofficial guy of all things teaching people in our club, um, I am currently working on a curriculum for that, and I'm going to try and put something together, figure out a location where we can do it, where it's actually dark enough where we can practice those skills, and that'll be for members only, right? If you have to be a member of the club to attend that as well. If you are, even but even without that, though, if you're new to the hobby of astronomy, I highly recommend joining an astronomy club. It is the best way to learn the hobby, to be part of a community of people that are all supporting each other, all rooting for each other to grow in this hobby and, and develop the skills of being an astronomer. I know I personally have grown tremendously as an astronomer because of my membership in NEFAS. If you don't live in the Jacksonville area, but you do live in the St. Augustine area, all that same stuff I said, except for the specific things like the telescopes or whatever, but those benefits are true of our friends the Ancient City Astronomy Club. They're also a great community of guys who support each other, and they probably have things going on. I don't know their exact perks. You can be a member of their club as well. They are also part of the Astronomical League. I do know that. Um, our club does a lot of outreach things. Uh, we post them on our calendar here on our website. I highly recommend checking this out once in a while. Um, the big one that we do for everybody, we do private events like this one at Ritz-Carlton and stuff. Schools, homeschool groups will often ask us to come out and set up telescopes, and we do. Um, not every event makes the calendar. Sometimes it's literally like a homeschool group will email us and say, I need one guy with a telescope to just come out and talk to the kids. You know who that guy with the telescope is? It's me. It's always me. So <laughs> we don't bother putting that on the schedule because I'm going to go do it, right? We do a lot of that stuff. Like I said, we're an educational foundation. But our, our, our calendar is a great place to find when we're going to do Hannah Park next time, right? When we're going to go to the Dark Sky uh, site, that kind of thing. So definitely check out our website, even if you're not interested in becoming a member. It's still a great way to keep up with what our club is doing every month. And I am going to get someone to put this stream on the calendar. I keep saying we need to put this live stream on the calendar. Because, um, darn it, I'm, I'm advertising the club. The club should advertise for me. Um, with that housekeeping stuff out of the way, uh, let's see here. Uh, we've got a few people in the chat now. Oh, Prasna's on. What's up, Prasna? Wanakam, welcome. Uh, nice to see you. You were right on to start this topic of the size of the stars. I know you see the stars comparison with our solar system. It just blows my mind. Yeah, absolutely, dude. Like, if astronomy's not blowing your mind, find a different hobby, man, because that's what it's good for. Um, if a nuclear war broke out, how far away could you be until you stop seeing the flashes on the surface? Honestly, like... The moon. It wouldn't have to get that far away, I don't think. Um, James Webb Space Telescope status update. Um, yeah, we can check that out. Uh, you could maybe make it so it's linked to a bank account, linked to the nonprofit. Oh, I, get, I see what Martian's saying. I could monetize this channel, but just have it go straight to the nonprofit, and I don't actually see any of the money. I guess it's possible. I. Don't have nearly the subscribers or anything to monetize anyway, but that is an idea for the future. Uh, if you're monetizing, you have to be especially careful about um, copyrighted material and stuff because they can actually come after you for that money. Um, so I'm, I'm hesitant as well because not being monetized gives me more freedom um, in that way, although it also doesn't give me any money. Uh, so let's talk about the James Webb. I'm actually curious what the latest update is with the James Webb. Let me, let's just Google it real fast. What's going on with the James Webb? Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Let's see what NASA has to say. Uh, currently at its observing spot, Lagrange Point 2. Cool. Uh, sharing live updates. Space.com. Okay, uh, Space.com is sharing live updates about it. From what I understand, um, it's still taking um, some test images uh, to, to test some of the, uh, the features, but man, some of these test images look great. Um, let me uh, pull one up for you real fast, I guess. Uh, I don't know if Wikimedia Commons is going to have one. I'm pretty sure NASA would be cool if we bringing this up, but nonetheless, let's just see if we've got any. Yeah, I didn't think we would. Well, here we go. 
So this is um, what they're doing, these like image sharpness tests. Uh, the James Webb has a few different um, systems, a few different, um, uh, basically like the stuff hits the main mirror and there's a couple of different um, um, sensors on the James Webb. Um, these near spec and near cam, those stand for something, I have no idea. So they've tested various ones, taken a bunch of images of stars. Look at this one from the Miri. Look at the gas and stuff. I wish it wasn't so small. But, yeah, from what I understand, James Webb's still running test images and things right now to get up and running. Um, the James Webb is a little iffy because when the Hubble went up, you could go, ooh, I can't wait to see the pictures from this telescope, and it gave you these amazing images. The James Webb is not working in the visible spectrum. It's doing things like infrared and radio astronomy. So the images it's going to give us are not going to be images in the classic sense of look at this big spiraling galaxy of many colors. It's going to be kind of like stuff like this. But the data from the James Webb is going to be really, really useful uh, to help answer some of the questions that we have in astronomy right now. Questions about... Um, uh, the way to know it's a web image is that it has six arms. That's a good point that Martian's pointing out here. Uh, what he's talking about is the diffraction spikes. You see how all these bright stars have six spikes on them, right? And that's because the structure of um, what's holding up the sensors is reflected in the diffraction spikes. This is actually a common phenomenon of Earth-based telescopes as well. Excuse me, I'm, I keep rubbing, I just, my allergies are really getting me. So, um... If you look at bright stars through what, like a Dobsonian telescope or a refracting, te a reflecting telescope, which I'll show you a picture of what that looks like, right, this style of telescope here, so this image shows it really well. There's an obstruction in the front, right? The light goes past this, hits the mirror, and bounces back. So bright stars, these little arms will, like, cut into that starlight, and cause it to do the big spikes coming off, right? So, um, reflecting style telescopes do that. The James Webb telescope as you'll see has a similar design. So you see that there's this thing out in the front and the mirror in the back. Each one of these arms has a splitting effect. So because there's three arms Three splits equals six spikes. Does that kind of make sense? Four arms actually tends to only give you four spikes, though, because the splits end up overlapping with each other, right? So you still get four spikes on four, on four things coming in and holding it, whereas if you have three, you tend to get six spikes. Um, although I've looked through a Dobsonian before that had six spikes um, it was somebody else's telescope. I didn't get a good look to see how their spider, the spider is what we call the thing that holds the secondary in a, in a telescope. I didn't, I didn't look and see how their spider was arranged to maybe account for why his gave him six spikes and mine gives me four. Um, it's an effect you usually only notice when you really crank in on a star. But yeah, as uh, Martian points out, the James Webb, um, all of its test images are throwing six diffraction spikes. Um, and they're orange. Um, they're actually orange, I want to say, for the same re Oh, I can zoom in. Look at that. I want to say they're orange for the same reason that the black hole image is orange, which is that the telescope is actually taking a monochromatic image. It's a black and white image. But the orange color is applied to that to make it easier to see the details. That would be a bit more faint in a black and white image. The human eye doesn't differentiate the black and white as well as it does if you apply a color. And by convention... Certain colors are applied to certain things, and so the, the standard convention is to give infrared light and radio waves the orange tint, right? So that's why the James Webb images are orange. Uh, let's see here. Do we have any other topics or questions or anything that people are interested in? Or you guys are just totally cool with whatever I want to talk about, it sounds like. Well, um... Let's see, what can we talk about? Why don't we, because I don't think I have, on any of my live streams, I don't think it's ever come up, no one ever asks 
about comets. And I think comets are really cool. So if you guys will indulge me, um, now watch, I'm going to go back and watch my live streams and I talk about comets all the time and I just forget it, but if you guys will indulge me, unless you have something else you want to talk about, in which case, definitely put that in the chat, but I might just talk about comets for a bit until you guys ask some other questions. So comets are, um, I know it's, it's a, kind of a 90 degree turn in the conversation, but it is something I, I would like to talk about more on this channel and y'all aren't asking any questions, so I'm going I'm to bring it up. Comets are, first of all, we always have a saying in astronomy, um, we say that comets are like cats, they have tails, they do exactly what they want to do. <laughs> right? Comets are notoriously difficult to predict how they're going to behave. But let's talk about what a comet is. Right? This is a very common um, misconception among a lot of uh, people, the general, the general public, I guess. is. I don't know how I feel about saying the general public, because people are people. But um, the, there's a really common misunderstanding about what a comet is. And I feel like comets are a really great example of something where everyone knows what a comet is until you ask them what a comet is, in which case they suddenly don't know, right? A really good example, and I know I've told this story on this channel before because this is all sounding really familiar to me, but a really common example, and why don't I put an image of a comet up here while I'm talking about them? I've got to get better at my visuals. Here's a really good one. We'll, we'll put Neo Eyes. Yeah, this was a good comment, man. Put that guy in the background. So, I was doing a, an event one time, and we had a comment. It was really faint, but we were able to see it. And I was like, hey, who wants to see a comment, man? Let's come check it out. And um, there was a little girl there, and she said, what's a comment? And her brother, her older brother, said, you, you know how older brothers can be. He's like, you, you know what a comment is? So I looked this kid in the eye, and I said, okay, what's a comment? And he was like, oh, well, I don't know. You know, and I was like, hmm, right? Because everyone's like, oh, obviously, I know what a comet is. And then it's like, oh, wait, no, I don't. So a, a misconception about it is that it's a big streak of, like, a fireball, right? Like, you would imagine, like, a meteor. That's what a meteor is, right? A, a, a rock chunk comes in through the atmosphere, bursts into flames on its way in, basically, because of friction with the atmosphere. You get this streak of fire behind a comet. In fact, a lot of like old classic depictions of comets seem to do that. Um, obviously, I can remember how to spell. Here we go. Bayou Tapestry. There is actually a comet in the Bayou Tapestry. Uh, here we go. Right? And you see how they've depicted it with like flames coming off of it, right? So, that's an easy um, misunderstanding of, of a comet. That's an easy one to make. Actually, comets are the exact opposite of that. What a comet really is, is it's a chunk of ice, right? It's an ice phenomenon. Um, what they are is, we sometimes describe them as being dirty snowballs. Um, some comets are more like snowy dirt balls, but they're basically chunks of rock and ice that are sort of low density. They're not packed very tight, usually. And um, they're sort of held together by the frozen ice. And when we say ice, we do mean water ice. There's a lot of water in a comet. But also um, ammonia, nitrogen, some carbon dioxide, these kinds of things. Um, in fact, there's so much water in in comets that there is a hypothesis that the water we have on Earth may have been the result of early cometary impacts, comets hitting the Earth early on in the Earth's formation and donating water to our newly formed planet, right? Um, but what happens with a comet is when it gets too close to the sun, that ice undergoes a process called sublimation. So you're familiar with ice in Earth-like conditions where if you take an ice cube, you can melt that and get water, and then you take the water, you can boil that and get steam, right? So it goes from solid to liquid to gas. It melts and then it evaporates. Um, sublimation is where you skip the water step entirely, and it goes straight from ice to steam, right? And 
the exact conditions for this depend on the pressure, which in a vacuum, no pressure, um, and the temperature involved and this kind of thing. Um, there's uh, something called a phase diagram. So we bring up the water phase diagram. Um, and do, do, do. so can I make this any bigger? Here we go. So this is the water phase diagram. This little point right here is what we call standard temperature and pressure. So on the earth, we're usually somewhere in this line, right? So if it's cold enough, it's solid. We get it warm enough, it turns liquid. We get it warm enough, it turns to steam, right? However, if we lower the pressure, right, we eventually get to a point called the triple point. If we lower the pressure below the triple point, then if it's cold enough, it's ice, and if it's hot enough, it's vapor. And there is no temperature where it's liquid, right? I, I hope you guys are following along with us. I know we're kind of getting a little in the chemistry weeds right here, but basically um, the vertical axis on this chart is the pressure, right? You get the pressure high enough, you cannot melt ice. It's always going to be ice. You get the pressure low enough, and it doesn't have to melt. It can go straight to being steam. And that's what's happening in a comet. When a comet gets close enough to the sun, the ice on the comet, which is water ice, but is also like frozen nitrogen, frozen carbon dioxide, frozen ammonia, these kinds of things, um, that ice turns immediately to steam, and that's called sublimation, right? It doesn't melt, that's going from ice to water. It doesn't boil, that's going from water to steam. It goes ice to steam, and that's called sublimation. Now, the sun is always kicking off what we call solar wind. It's not really wind, it's just a whole bunch of charged particles and stuff that the sun radiates outward all the time, right? Um, and so, is that long piece of fabric? Uh, yeah. Um, so somebody commented on the Bayeux Tapestry. That is the Norman Conquest. The Bayeux Tapestry depicts the Norman Conquest, and there was a comet during the Norman Conquest, and it's in the tapestry, which is kind of cool. Um, but anyway, so that steam is coming off, and then the sun's solar wind blows that steam away from the core of the comet, which is actively producing more. And so you get this tail coming off of the comet. So if you imagine, and um, there's actually a really cool demonstration you can do, and one of these days, I'm going to plan it in advance, advertise it really well, whatever. I would love to do this demonstration at Hannah Park for people. But you can basically make a simulated comet. You get a bunch of rocks, you get some dry ice, um, obviously you use proper safety gear. Um, you, get, you get some water, you bust up the dry ice, mix with the water, the rocks, throw a little ammonia in there, whatever, and you compress it and let it freeze again. And you make a comet that has the same composition of actual comets. And then you, you see that dry ice is just sublimating. By the way, that's why dry ice is dry. It's frozen carbon dioxide that sublimates under Earth-like conditions. And then, so all of the sublimating, and then you take a hair dryer and you blow that back, and you show the creation of the tail. Now, what's really interesting is it's natural in our minds to see something that looks like this and imagine, oh, it's clearly going this way, right? It's heading that way with something streaming behind it. But that's actually not true. The comet's tail always points away from the sun, right? So if the comet is headed towards the sun, the tail is behind it, but when it whips around and goes the other way, where it's heading back out into the deep solar system, the tail of the comet is actually out in front of it, preceding it as it goes. You'll also notice this comet has two tails, this bluish tail right here, and this sort of whitish tail right here. The blue tail right here is the um, ion tail, and that's um, the, uh, it's the steam, basically, right? And it always points straight away from the sun. The other tail is dust and dirt and rocks and stuff coming off the comet, which is very reflective and appears much brighter and is easier to see. You would think, and I always assume, that the part of the comet you see is the steam. But actually, that part's harder to see. It's all the rocks and dirt and stuff coming off the comet as it's basically falling apart that makes the much more visible tail, um, which has a slight bend to it. Because this material is heavier, it is not as easy to push into a straight line with the solar wind. And it's going to more follow the curve of the orbit a little bit. Um, so that's what you see with a comet. Um, when they're deep 
out in deep space, they basically just look a little bit blurry, right? Um, as they approach the sun, the sun sublimates them, they, they look a little blurry, and then when they get closer, the solar wind picks up enough to blow back and form a tail. So, at range, comets just look like slightly blurry things. It's when they get closer to the sun that they form that big tail and, and the classic comet shape. Uh, throw it at a model of the Earth. <laughs> yeah, right? That's what we'll do. We'll build that comet thing and then we'll, we'll throw it at a simulated Earth. Um, when comets hit the Earth, obviously bad stuff happens. Um, a smaller comet... What will often happen with like what will often happen with a comet that comes into the atmosphere because they're much more low density, they tend to break up and they don't make it all the way to the ground, right? In the air, all that heating and everything, that comet will start to break up and they'll just explode sometimes. Um, I imagine bigger comets might make it all the way to the ground. I'm not really an expert on it, uh, but I do know they do have the potential to blow up off the surface of the of the ground. Um, there's a famous event. Uh, it's the Tunguska event, where a bunch of people near Siberia reported a very bright flash and then saw this, right? Trees all flattened, and they were all flattened in a certain direction, and if you find all the flattened trees, right, they're pointing directly away from a central point. Um, now, this was back in 1908. This is back well before nuclear weapons. So, thankfully, nobody was like... Because, remember, this is Siberia. you think people were going to be like, oh, we're being nuked, right? But, no. Um, and a lot of people thought, well, a meteor or something hit. But nobody ever found the thing that hit. There's no crater. And then, so it's now thought that what probably happened in the Tunguska event is that a comet came in through Earth's atmosphere and didn't make it all the way to the ground, but exploded in midair and flattened all these trees without leaving a crater. So, a uh, really neat event and an example of what happens when a comet comes in, and literally within human memory, right? There's people that saw this. Uh, obviously, larger comets would be a planet killer threat, just like... Um, uh, you know, the one that took out the dinosaurs, which was, that was actually an asteroid, but, uh, somebody was about to bring up Tunguska, also did you know if that thing was a few hours off, it would have hit St. Petersburg, yeah, that would have definitely changed history, man, um, <laughs> earlier Russian Civil War, yeah, maybe, um, I'm curious who Martian is, by the way, if you're someone that knows me in real life, I'm curious who you are, because you have been blowing up the chat, my dude, um, does any, again, does anybody who isn't Martian, although I'm loving the interaction, don't get that twisted, does anybody who isn't Martian have, oh, it's Cooper, awesome, Cooper is, I sh oh, I should remember that's you, that's right, Cooper is a, another club member, um, he's a really cool kid, uh, Cooper, what are you, you're like in, uh, high school, middle school, and, um, he's, uh, He's very passionate about the hobby. He's got a telescope, and he has a very supportive mom who brings him to all the astronomy stuff. Um, but just a really cool kid. He always he always comes and hangs out with us, and and is very respectful and always open to learn, um, and and explore the universe. And I think it's awesome uh, to feed curiosity and that kind of thing. So uh, Cooper's a really cool person and definitely a friend of the channel. Um, Okay, but did anybody else have any uh, any questions or topics or anything that they're interested in? Um, cause I, I guess I could keep talking about comets if you guys don't have any other things. So, a uh, good question as well is where do comets come from, right? And the answer is there's a couple places, right? So, um, this actually does a good job of, of showing both of the things I'm talking about, and it is in Hindi? Okay, um, <laughs> I, here we go. Here's the English language version. So, we actually have two populations of comets. There's what are called short period comets, and there's what are called long period comets. Long period comets have orbits that are longer than 200 years. 
and the difference between a short period comet's orbit and a long period or comet's orbit is actually vast. It's not just a minor distinction. We've got a whole bunch of comets of like 200 or fewer years, and then other comets that take thousands of years to come back, right? It's a very stark difference. So, this has led astronomers to suspect that there are actually more than one cometary population in the solar system. There's more than one source for these comets. So, one source is something called the Kuiper Belt, right? Um, the Kuiper Belt is a big, flat disk of cometary bodies orbiting out about where Pluto's orbit is and out. In fact, Pluto orbits right in the Kuiper Belt. It's why Pluto's no longer considered a planet, right? It's because it's actually now a, it's just a part of the Kuiper Belt. Um, objects in the Kuiper Belt, they're all big, rocky, icy chunks, right? And if interactions with the gravity of other planets alters the orbit of the Kuiper Belt object, it'll alter so that the object starts off way out past Pluto, comes in, comes in, whips around the sun, and goes back out. Right? Comets have these very stretched out, elongated orbits. They spend most of their time just out in deep space minding their own business, and then they come in and they whip around the sun real fast and sublimate a bunch and throw a bunch of stuff out in their orbit. Uh, which the Earth later passes through, that's actually what causes meteor showers, and then they head back out. The second population of comets is something called the Oort Cloud. And if you look at this image, this blue rectangle that shows the entire solar system, this is the whole, all the planets we know are inside of this fuzzy area, right? Neptune's orbit touches the edge of it, right? This is bigger than the solar system by a lot. This whole rectangle is this tiny little box right in here, and the Oort cloud is this big. The Oort cloud is so huge that it's thought that our Oort cloud reaches out as far as the Oort clouds of some of the other nearby stars, and that some of their comets may get caught by us and vice versa. That's how big the Oort cloud is, is it's like halfway to Alpha Centauri. It's absolutely mind-blowingly huge in terms of like being compared to the size of the star. The individual objects themselves, really tiny, right? They're just comets, but they're spread out in this enormous, enormous bubble around the Milky, uh, the Milky Way, around the solar system. And same thing, they'll occasionally come in, whip around the sun and head back out, but because their orbits are so huge, when one of them comes, comes in and whips around the sun and then leaves, bye-bye, we'll never see that guy again. Right, because it's going to be 4,000 years before that comet comes back, or 6,000 years, or 3,000 years um, before it comes back from the Oort cloud. So it's, it's really interesting to me, personally, that the one phenomena, comets, have two different causes, right? And in science, we have um, Occam's razor, which is that we should try to avoid an overly complicated solution for something. So typically, if you have one phenomenon, you would expect it to have one general cause, but the evidence bears out that there's two populations of comets, right? And Occam's razor says you have to decide between equivalently supported theories, right? And then the simpler of the ones that has the equal support. Well, the only model with enough support is this model, where there's two populations of comets, right? A simpler model doesn't explain what we observe, so this is what it must be, um, is that there really are two, because they're very distinct. It's There's very obviously... Comets that orbit every 70 or so years or, or less, you know, up to 200, and then these guys that take forever, um, that have to uh, be orbiting way out here. And the reason why we know how big the Oort cloud is, if you want to know, is, uh, oh, he said, bye. Dude, amazing having you here tonight, Cooper. Really appreciate you hanging out with us, man. Have a wonderful evening. Great interaction, like I said. Uh, so the reason why we know how big the Oort cloud is um, is because of the fact that any object orbiting another object, the speed that it orbits and the time it takes to orbit is a constant. It's determined by the laws of physics, right? If you take an object orbiting the Earth you, and you have it in a stable orbit further away, it will have to orbit slower. It's just the laws of how these things orbit. So when a comet comes in and whips around the sun, Based on its motion, you can figure out exactly how big its orbit is. You don't have to see it complete the whole orbit to know how big the orbit is, 
because the properties it shows coming in and whipping around the sun tell you definitively exactly what orbit it has. It's, it's foolproof. And so that's the other big thing why we know that this model is correct. It's because we know these long period comets really do come from every direction, first of all. Short period comets tend to all come in on the plane. The long period comets come from everywhere. So the Oort cloud must be spherical. And then we know for the really, really long period comets, we know how big their orbit is. That's how we know how long they take because we don't clock them over the case of 4,000 years. We calculate that. And so we know the distance of the Oort cloud. So we can figure out the Oort cloud without ever observing it directly based on the behavior of the comets that come from it. Whereas the Kuiper belt, we have a bit more direct observation because it's a lot closer and we see these comets coming and going regularly. We can figure out all their orbits and sort of figure out where the Kuiper belt is. Um, although this image makes it look super dense like this, it's not. Um, like with the asteroid belt, um, the comets are like way far apart from each other. They never really hit each other, um, right? So like famously like in Star Wars, like only a fool would go into an asteroid field or whatever. In reality, in the asteroid belt, the only risk of hitting an asteroid is if you're suicidal and you do it on purpose. Like, you can, you can throw a spaceship blindly through the asteroid belt, and if you hit something, you won the worst lottery ever. Um, this is the, the vast emptiness from one asteroid to the next. And the same thing with the Kuiper belt, but even more so with the Oort cloud, right? It's not like it's a thick cloud of anything. That's why when we look at other stars, we don't see their Oort clouds, right? Um, because it's more like, imagine a swarm of, like, fruit flies, and you have, like, 300 fruit, fruit flies swarming over the entire city of Jacksonville. You wouldn't see the flies. You would just see the city of Jacksonville. They're too tiny and too far apart to notice. Even if the swarm has, like, a couple hundred flies in it, right, at that scale with something that tiny, you just wouldn't ever see it. So that's why we don't see the Oort clouds around other stars. But we can infer their existence because other stars must be like our star, right? And we know that we have an Oort cloud because of these long period comets. Well, we've got eight minutes left in the chat, and I think everyone's just about asked everything they wanted to ask. Um, but I'm going to leave it open for eight minutes because I promise you guys 9.30 and I mean it, man. So, again, if anybody... If you're still watching the show, even if you don't have a question, man, say hi in the chat so I know that somebody other than Cooper has been here tonight. <laughs> but honestly, say hi, whatever, in the chat. Remind me that you're here. I'm just curious who's still hanging out with me. Um, and any topics, questions, whatever, I don't know how deep we can get in the next eight minutes, but we're going to hang out for another eight minutes. And then we're going to wrap this thing up. Um... Let's see. Yeah, I guess I've said everything I wanted to say about comets, man. Uh, comets are... Oh, so I said they're like cats, right? So what I mean by that is um, when a comet's going to be coming around... Uh, Charlie Mark, what's up? Uh, when a comet's going to be coming around, um, it's hard to predict, like, is it going to be a really bright one? Is it not going to be super bright? Whatever. Um, because that sublimation is happening with an object that's not as simple as, if it was just an ice cube, we'd be like, yeah, it's going to sublimate this bright. But it's because of all the rock and stuff that comets will tend to get, like, jets coming out the sides and stuff, and it's hard to predict how bright a comet is going to be. So it's often the case that they'll be like, hey, this comet is expected to reach a certain magnitude, and then, uh, yeah, um, nope. <laughs> <laughs> right, it doesn't do what we thought it was going to do. Uh, Jamie Fraser's here. What's up, Jamie? Uh, didn't hear from you earlier in the chat, so I don't know if you just joined or if you were here and you were just hanging out, man. That's cool, too. According to um, YouTube, we've got like five or six people hanging out right now, so that's pretty awesome, man. I'd like to hear from you guys. Again, I know that not everybody can participate in the chat, and I also know that um, a lot of people... Um, will just, like, Chromecast this to their TV and just chill and watch it, so I know that some of the people watching it are just being passive observers, and that's totally cool. I'm getting more accustomed to that as I do these shows, and I take it as a compliment, too, in a way, because if you guys were getting super bored, I think you would be louder about it. 
<laughs> I guess uh, if you guys are sitting quietly and listening, I must be holding your attention, right? Um, so, yeah, I I had a wonderful time tonight. Um, we definitely talked about some really cool stuff. Just to recap real fast, we talked about different types of stars, why stars twinkle super bright near the horizon and throw wild disco colors. Seriously, get out and look at it sometime. When you see a star near the horizon, just going nuts. Um, and we talked about uh, the super massive black hole, Sagittarius A star. I want to put that picture back up, man. That is, gosh, I would love for that to be the thumbnail of this video, dude. That that black hole image is uh, really cool. That's history making stuff, by the way. Um, that is, um, there we go. Oh, this is all we had of Sagittarius A star prior to this image, by the way. Uh, it's it, the naming convention for supermassive black holes is to put a star after it. So Sagittarius A star, the one they got in M87, they were calling it M87 star, right? That's the typical. Um, oh, here's interesting. This is the size comparison of Sagittarius A star's event horizon as compared to Deneb and Rigel. Look at that. It says Rigel A. Um, Rigel also has a companion star. A would be the big one, though. So you see how small of an area the event horizon takes up, and yet it has the equivalent mass of four million suns. Just honestly mind-blowing stuff. But here we go. Sagittarius A star. Going to make that our final image. Well, with the last four minutes of the stream... Uh, oh, and Cooper's back, too. Awesome. With the last four minutes of the stream, um, I just want to, again, thank you guys so much for watching the stream and supporting me. It means so much to me that I have a community of people watching these, that you guys get value out of this. You guys want to watch me do this every month and want to learn um, about the universe and, and help the channel grow. And I really do hope you guys will help the channel grow by sharing this thing far and wide, right? Uh, let people know. I forgot to create a Facebook event this time, too. So I'm honestly touched that there's anybody here tonight. Um, but do, like when I do create those events, share those with people. Um, it's, it's a public event. This is meant to be another form of outreach that I do. Um, and so that really helps out. You let people know about the, about the channel. Um, and, and tune in every month. That, that's just I think it's really awesome, and I'm so glad you guys are here. And I want to remind you guys to keep looking up, man. And with, I guess with my last three minutes, I'll address Cooper says, I heard of a story about how the night each Pizza Hut and the Russian space program made an uh, agreement to use a powerful projector to put the Pizza Hut logo on the moon, but later abandon the project. I'm skeptical of that claim. I've never heard of that, but that would be... Um, Oh, it's a story, okay. And he was saying, what do you think if you saw that in real life? I, If I looked at the moon in real life and I saw the Pizza Hut logo, I might sell my telescope. I honestly don't know what I would do. I'd be like, well, that's it for me, guys. I'm out. The, the moon's got corporate advertising. Astronomy's done. There's no more astronomy to do. Um, Prasanna says thank you. Uh, oh, he's saying this was a real plan, they, then they realized how dumb it was? I Yeah, I'll, I'll have to look into it some more and see if that ever really happened. I, I, I've not heard of it, it seems... Well, I don't know for sure. I, 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 I can look into it and, and see if that ever happened. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and call it two minutes early. Again, thank you guys so much. Um, feel free to keep hanging out in the chat for a little bit. I'm going to throw the end card up there. Um, I know that there's also a delay between when I speak and when you guys hear it. But um, good night and keep looking up.